Welcome back to Paul's Tech News. It's just another week in October 2022, you guys, and another major PC hardware launch has come and gone. This time, the RTX 4090 GPU from NVIDIA, which arrived with much commotion, guns a blazon to upend the benchmark leaderboards and set a new standard for performance expectations in a bleeding edge gaming graphics card. There was a mighty deluge of reviews and benchmarks to peruse, which I will attempt to boil down for you today. But then, just as you were about to turn your attention to next week's big launch, of Intel's Raptor Lake CPUs, and that'll be four out of four weeks in a row running with huge launches for those keeping track, by the way. Nvidia went and dropped this news Friday. The RTX 4080 12 gigabyte is canceled or unlaunched, as Nvidia puts it, like a Falcon 9 rocket returning to Earth, I suppose, leaving the RTX 4080 16 gigabyte to launch all by itself on November 16th. And I'm just not sure how I feel about it now. Relieved? Mad still? experiencing mild hallucinations and brief bouts of hysteria. Actually, that's probably just from the lack of sleep due to all the benchmarking I've been doing lately, so I'm sure it will pass. On with the tech news. Excellent. Thermal Take has done it. They've created a case fan with swappable fan blades, and it's called the Swafan. Available in 12 and 14 centimeter sizes, these high static pressure fans are ideal for use with radiators or dust filters, and they come with an extra set of reversed fan blades. Easy to replace and reverse your airflow, so now you can show off your fan's good side no matter where it's installed in your case. They use hydraulic bearings, feature three addressable LED rings, 2000 RPM max speed, and are, of course, very easy to clean. For more on the Swafan from Thermal Take, click the sponsor link in the video description. The word unlaunch was not a word until Friday, when NVIDIA used it to describe their updated plans for the much maligned RTX 4080 12 gig. It is unlaunched, or will not be launching, because having two GPUs with the 4080 designation is confusing. And you know what? That's actually pretty good thinking, NVIDIA. Perhaps you should develop branding standards to differentiate your products from one another. Consider adding a suffix like TI or super to the end, or you might even use a different number in the product name to show that it is in fact a different product, powered by a different GPU, with notably reduced core specifications, which is absolutely what the RTX 4080 12 gig was going to be if it launched with the memory bus and CUDA core count it was originally configured with. As many, many reviews viewers have pointed out, the stats for the 4080 12 gig indicated a GPU with 70 class performance at best, not 80 class, and so it seemed Nvidia was attempting to lead us down the garden path in an attempt to overvalue the AD104 powered graphics card, and those assumptions were backed up by Nvidia's own performance numbers for the two cards, which were just published on Wednesday before the card was cancelled. But why the sudden change of heart from Team Green? We could be generous and credit them for listening to fan feedback and criticism since the announcement and adjusting their rollout plans accordingly. And while I'm sure that was a factor, my perspective leans toward the cynical side, so I'm guessing it was a business decision, perhaps motivated by one or two specific things. The RTX 4090 launch resulted in sold out inventory across the board for the $1,600 plus cards, so perhaps the market situation indicated that a single $1,200 RTX 4080 16 gig option would suffice, and a $900 cut down entry would only dilute those sales. Or maybe Nvidia caught wind of early RDNA 3 performance, since AMD's Radeon team has new cards launching soon too, and didn't like the optics if it's looking like the Navi 31 powered 7900 XT for example might outperform what would have been classified as an RTX 4080. Which would be somewhat poetic, if our assumptions are true that Nvidia only called it a 4080 in the first place to inflate its value, then the inverse would also be true. An underperforming RTX 4080 could then be more easily humiliated by an upstart rival. The upshot for consumers and reviewers is that there is thankfully only going to be one RTX 4080 launching next month, the RTX 4080 16 gig, now confirmed to be going up for sale on November 16th. So I wonder if we can just drop the 16 gig designation and just call it the RTX 4080 now, like civilized people. And the other upshot you might not have considered is the plight of add-in board partners, who may very well have already manufactured, boxed up, and even shipped out the first run of the now unlaunched RTX 4080 12 gig. Any of those efforts are now all for naught. Although I would not be in the least bit surprised if we find RTX 4070 stickers covering up old RTX 4080 12 gig labels on cards and boxes when that GPU eventually launches. I mean, there was already an RTX 4050 retail box spotted at a Galax event in the Philippines, so you know the add in board partners get a good head start on the new GPU rollouts. Or maybe that's just what they'll be calling the 4080 12 gig now. 
Fortunately though, there's no other recent evidence of Nvidia making decisions that piss off their board partners and lead to massive changes in the industry. <coughs> EVGA. <coughs> but let's not let that RTX 4080 news overshadow its big bro, the RTX 4090, which is available for sale as of Wednesday, and they're gone. Yes, sold out everywhere as some predicted, although perhaps just a tad slower than during the GPU shortage based on my estimations. And with good reason, it could be argued as both my review and countless others pointed out that, um, yeah, the RTX 4090 is a beast, about 40 to 70% better raw rasterization performance at 4K versus the previous gen RTX 3090, and that's not even accounting for new feature support such as DLSS 3.0 or its capabilities in non-gaming content creation type tasks. The best analysis for DLSS 3.0 published so far was absolutely from Hardware Unboxed, who dedicated an entire person, Tim, to analyzing the technology, in particular scrutinizing DLSS 3.0 frame generation, which promises to increase frame rates by inserting AI-generated frames in between the traditionally rasterized ones. To sum up, this technique is not without issues, but it does work well at higher refresh rates, 180 to 240 hertz or beyond, because the AI-generated frames are on screen for less time and any visual miscues the AI comes up with are quickly replaced by the next frame. But Tim had plenty of valid critiques as well, specifically, lower refresh rate gaming at 60 hertz makes problems with generated frames more apparent and those problems come in a few varieties on-screen ui text can appear garbled in ai generated frames with movement as shown in flight simulator as well as f1 2022 likewise significant visual anomalies can appear when the scene changes quickly such as switching to cockpit view in a racing game or panning around the aircraft in flight simulator against the background of a blue sky this means that gamers on 60 hertz displays or who are using less powerful hardware that can't produce high frame rates will be less happy with the LSS 3.0 if the tech is enabled on older GPUs or they come out with lower end GPUs in the 40 series. And it does seem like that will be possible as a Redditor named Just Dax has already gotten DLSS 3.0 frame generation to work with an RTX 2070 in Cyberpunk doubling their frame rate. Latency is also a concern as frame generation adds about 10 to 15 milliseconds versus running without it, resulting in a peculiar combination of higher frame rates with slightly more sluggish input reaction time. This is acceptable in some games like Flight Simulator, but it's unfortunately a no-go for competitive FPS gaming in particular. Rounding out the reviews, I thought it would be nice to give a nod to the 4090's animation and rendering chops, and for that, I'm recommending this video by Sir Wade Nestat, which does a great job covering several workloads, including 16K image renders and animations in Blender, ray tracing, and Maya, with comparisons of viewport performance as well as rendering. Basically, the RTX 4090 can save digital artists time, and time is money, so check out the entire video as well as the hardware unboxed DLSS 3.0 analysis via the links down in the video's description. So all that now remains to launch this year, apart from the RTX 4080 of course, and Intel's 13th gen core CPUs next week, is RDNA 3, which will power the GPU chiplets in the AMD Radeon 7000 series of graphics cards. And what will those cards be? Well, Enermax may have tipped us off on that one, as an update to their PSU calculator spotted by Twitter leaker MoMoMo underscore US now shows four of them, the Radeon RX 7700 XT, 7800 XT, 7900 XT, and 7950 XT, which have estimated board power ratings in the 200 to 400 20 watt range based on Enermax's PSU recommendations. It's unclear whether Enermax has inside info on these cards or if they're just updating their calculator based on rumors or ballpark info from industry partners. I doubt this means that the full stack of Radeon 7000 series cards will launch this year though, as they also list NVIDIA RTX 40 series cards, including the RTX 4070 and 4060, which we probably won't see until early 2023 at the soonest. When will the Radeon 7000 series GPUs launch though? We know the announcement is November 3rd, but for the impatient, there's speculation afoot already. It's mixed though. Other Twitter leaker Graymon55 says around November 20th, perhaps the 21st, which would place it two to three weeks after the announcement, which is a pretty typical time frame. But another rumor sourced from Billy Billy informant enthusiast citizen says nay, they will launch in December, and also they do not have the ray tracing or rasterization chops to keep up with Nvidia's 40 series, but again, this is a rumor that is difficult to confirm at this time. But what constitutes a launch anyway? Radeon SVP and GM Scott Herkelman originally said November 3rd was the launch, but AMD marketing director Darren McPhee's more recent tweet says that's the unveil date. Then there's the review embargo, which 
which is sometimes the same date and time as the for sale on store shelves date, but is often a day to a week prior, which is better in my opinion, so consumers can check the reviews before making a buying decision. I think a November 3rd announcement and a launch on the 21st is most likely since the 21st is a Monday, but we'll have more details hopefully by November 3rd at the latest. One final RDNA 3 rumor is that the cards might support better display out standards, specifically DisplayPort 2.1 that can push a 4K 240Hz signal or 8K at 120Hz and would be a fine answer back to Nvidia's choice to limit the RTX 4090 to DisplayPort 1.4a. And now it's time for perhaps the briefest tech briefs ever because I am legitimately all out of time this week. Onward, Linus Tech Tips is building out a big old laboratory and this week they revealed MarkBench, a benchmarking tool that automates many of the tedious repetitive button clicking and stats logging tasks that go along with traditional benchmarking. Having just spent an exorbitant amount of time in the past three weeks doing these exact tasks myself, I am both incredibly offended that they waited until after two thirds of the benchmarking season was through to go public with this, but I also take that back immediately as long as they give me access to MarkBench too so I can likely reclaim hours of time during benchmark testing while providing you guys with more data to chew on during launch reviews. I'm a little surprised the Mark Bench name wasn't already taken though. Intel has new CPUs launching next week, as previously mentioned, but there are more 13th gen core processors in queue than the six SKUs that they've revealed so far. And the whole stack, we hope, has now been revealed by Gigabyte's Z790 motherboard compatibility charts. The 125 watt 13900K, 13700K, and 13600K, which are already appearing in retail boxes shared by some extremely early adopters, will be joined by 65 watt and 35 watt SKUs too. There are way too many of them for me to list them all off. But yes, the Quad Core 13100 is back again, although it is just running Alder Lake under the hood. But who knows, it could be a budget darling like the 12100 was, if Best Buy can keep the damn thing in stock. 22 CPUs in total are listed, some with iGPUs, some without, and likely we'll see more of these announced and or launched at CES 2023. Oh, and about the RTX 4090, there is just one more thing. Der Bauer reviewed the Aorus Master RTX 4090 from Gigabyte, and the teardown revealed some telltale traces on the PCB that clearly were meant for NVLink fingers that might have enabled dual GPU mode for gaming. I say gaming, but really just 3D Mark since games aren't really optimized for SLI anymore. But does this mean that SLI was scrapped late in the development cycle, or simply that Gigabyte used PCB layouts that were crossed over from the 3090 Ti, or maybe workstation cards that still support it? We may never know for sure, but allow me to dangle this teaser in front of your face on my way out. Nvidia and TSMC have supposedly already produced a lot of chips for the 40 series, and we know that the full-sized AD102 GPU has better stats than the 4090 ships with. So is it possible that Nvidia is sandbagging somewhat with the RTX 4090? XPEA GPU on Twitter claims binned dies are already being set aside for a 4090 Ti class GPU with close to three gigahertz clock speeds and 10 to 20% more performance. Might that card feature NVLink SLI support, or maybe a DisplayPort 2.1 upgrade to match the Radeon 7000 series? Could be, I'm just speculating, but I guess the bigger question would be how much Nvidia thinks they'd be able to charge for that card. Probably a lot. But that's all the teaser dangling I am able to present you with today. So there you have it guys, tech news for the week. And if you liked it, click that like button or leave me a comment down below. While you're down there, all the articles I talked about today are linked in the description if you're interested. And check out my store at paulsharbor.net for high quality merchandise, t-shirts, hoodies, beer sets, and more, including my awesome new 8-bit designs, which are super awesome. Subscribing to my channel is always a good call too. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you next week.